I've got running water. I've got oh. extra smoker fuel, extra skewers, extra queen cages, and I tuck the queens as I catch them under the seat to keep them out of the sun. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Extra knives, anything you might need while you're working bees, and a marking pen. Uh, if I got three mated queens in these. There are 12 nukes here. There's four little nukes on each stand, and I think three of them have lady, uh, laying queens, and I'm going to mark them red. Why am I marking them red? Does anyone know? It's the red year. It's not. It's, it's not? green. Oh. Nope. Yep, it's green year. I'm marking them red because they're, they're last year's queens. They're survivors from the Hudson Valley and I haven't gotten around to marking them yet. So I generally don't sell those queens. I keep them for myself to see how long they live and they could be potential breeders, nice. depending on how long they last. So, And I lost my last blue dot last year. She finally got superseded. She would have been going into her fifth year this year, but I've had like occasionally they go to year five, like several go to year four, but I still have some white dots and stuff who are like, like eh, eh, four. and. Eh. So it's like longevity is one of the things that like at least uh, they've made it this far, <laughs> you know, let them winter a couple winters up here and then some of that breeding stock I'll bring down to Florida so I can raise very early daughters. We don't really need to stop raising queens where I am in Florida. We always have drones. We can always have, have bees getting mated. So that's pretty exciting and I can do experiments, not worry about killing them. It's actually kind of hard to kill bees down there. But I bring down some of the New York stock to raise the daughters from so I can sell these northern hardy genetics back up to beekeepers when they want them, which is mostly March, April, things like that. So I'll do nine weeks down there, nine weeks up here. But my breeding stock and the queens that I really keep for myself, I'm, I'm starting to raise right now over on the other side of the Hudson River. So um, I'll just roll into these things and you all can get as close as you want. You can come help out, catch queens, blah, blah, blah. And so I generally don't use smoke on these things uh, because the smoke makes the queens run around. And I'll get the smoker lit, I'll smoke my hands, I'll use the smoke more on myself. But I will use like the scent of smoke to actually turn around the guard bees. It actually works to kind of direct the guard bees uh, away from whatever I'm doing, but doesn't make the queen actually run around. So I'll light it if I think they're a little bit twitchy because the temperature's dropping and et cetera, et cetera. But, so I use a piece of masonite here to keep them from pushing up this Reflectex, which is the shiny bubble wrap stuff. And so I got a screen bottom with a little dead air space. So I got two hives here. One's going this way, that way. There's a center divider. And there's another two little baby nukes in this one. So let's start with this one and we'll see what we got. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't keep them that small by like the start of July or so. I'll start combining them. I'll start pulling out the dividers and they, these are a baby size right now. If I pull out that divider and make them into an eight comb full box, that's a toddler size. And once they're two boxes, I start calling them teenagers. And at that point they have to start finding jobs of their own and feeding themselves. But, uh, <laughs> But uh, generally, I'm wintering them about three or four of these because they have more food in their pantry. They need less like supplemental feeding. You know, if I combine them early enough by like late June or, J or July, they got a chance of filling up if we have a good fall and stuff. So we're gonna see. Like I said, most of these don't have queens yet. So yeah, these are raising cells. Mm. Mm -hmm. So. I talked a little bit this morning in my talk about like doing these little walk away split experiments that I'm doing. So rather than like doing that grafting and all that intricate stuff with the tool where you're picking up the larva and learning how to do it, making these huge booming, booming hives. What I did with this is just, I followed this recipe that I'm tweaking and experimenting with. This was uh, a coma larva, which is right here. So I'm you got a free hand. You can do it, man. Got it. <laughs> so it's a coma larva and then just a comb of nectar. So they have food to feed that larva. And then I gave them two shakes of bees like that, just to really create the density. It's not about the overall population and the number of bees. It's about the density and how dense they are on that comb to make a good queen because they, it's, it simulates mm -hmm. kind of the crowdedness of swarming like that. So how many have they started on that one? See, this bee is feeding the cell right here. So this is a little tiny queenless nuke that is raising its own, own several cells. And so I got, one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, six, seven that I see here, and that's eight, nine, ten. Wow. They've started ten on this little tiny comb. Wow. And rather than like cutting them all out, dispersing them into the ten little hives, I'm just gonna let the best one win. Virgin Queen Deathmatch, you know? 
hopefully it'll be the best of the bunch. It won't be the runt of the litter. And so a lot of people don't do this because they think like, oh, grafting, you have like that control. And this is more about giving up that kind of control. With grafting, you can pick a first instar larva. That means it's, it hasn't gone through any molts yet. It has just hatched from the egg and it's young as possible. Whereas in a situation like this, they're just picking whatever larva they choose. And, and sometimes they will pick an older larva to get a queen a day faster or so. And often people are saying, oh, if it started from an older larva, it won't be as good a queen. She won't have as many ovarials and things like that. And I say, oh, she might live five years rather than six years or things like that. But what we know is that some of the studies um, showing that bees have a conscious control tearing down the inferior quality cells. And I really don't think that the f they might start cells from second instar, but I don't think that that is usually the cell that comes to fruition and actually becomes the queen. There are 10 cells started right here. Only one of them is going to get to be the queen. And they tend to be a pretty good quality. I started mentioning this spring when I was talking um, about sending these to the Tarpy Lab at NC State. And they've come back. Um, I only sent a dozen of them last year. And they all came back over 5 million sperm. So anything over 2 million sperm in the spermatheca is considered a decent queen. But generally, in the batches, they see under that when, when beekeepers have submitted samples of uh, uh, queens to them. See, I don't even need this. But um, th the queens that I sent were all over 5 million of the dozen of these emergency or bees choice queens that I'm calling them. And uh, one of them came back with 13.3 million sperm which I didn't think was physically possible <laughs> and that and unfortunately I didn't get that queen back or any of them <laughs> that, that I sent but the idea is I am just making more you know all the time so it's, it's relatively little resources let's see what our status is in this one and how long have those bees been in there in that box this one uh, we'll see this one has a laying queen uh, this box I just made just like two three days ago so those cells were just getting started I took them from a survivor hive uh, a strong hive that overwintered here and on this side I did that recipe and made them queenless but this side I actually took their mother so there she's she oh you got her oh yep there she is and she's still got a little bit of a red mark so I, I marked this one last year and I actually made this one pretty strong because I'm actually planning on probably going in and stealing her tomorrow and I've made them pretty strong because they can't stay in this little tiny box for long because you see what she uh, what they're doing at the bottom of this comb right in the middle here they're starting swarm cells yeah. so in a box this small they're babies they're either starving or swarming right now they're swarming so that's a, <laughs> that's a good thing and so i think tomorrow we're going to come up here and maybe split this thing and but for right now i'm going to give them a little extra mark because her red dot is actually faded since last year so i'll show you how i mark my queens i do it different than most beekeepers so I'll get her. That's go. good enough for me. <laughs> you just kind of pin her down and. Yeah, Tom Seely style, actually. I kind of like learned it from him because that's how he marks his um, bees when he's bee lining. Just like that. Uh, whereas I can pick her up and, and hold her by the wings. I grab two legs so she doesn't like start spinning around and like accidentally rip a leg off. And I can grab them by the wings if they're running around the comb. But uh, rather than doing that, I'll just let this queen. I can't believe it. no one's asked yet, why aren't they stinging you? Yeah, why aren't they stinging you? <laughs> uh, are they? Because they're bees. <laughs> you just you? No, I haven't gotten any stings yet. Not yet. <laughs> So rather than grabbing her by the wings, I will just get her in my hand, like so. Always scratch the candy, make sure it's not damp so she doesn't get stuck in it, which can be really bad. <laughs> and I like the plastic JZBZ queen cages, this style, because I don't have to grab her by the wings and force her head into the hole in order to the cage her. Uh, I just, like you see, I just scooped her up, put the cage over her, and she's crawling on in. She already has one, two little friends in there with her. If I were going to ship this queen, I would do five attendants. And the attendants I do grab by the wings because they, they will sting. Queens will never sting a human. I've like handled thousands of queens and I've never been stung by one. But these workers, yeah, they'll sting you all the time. <laughs> but so to get them in here, I do grab them by the wings and I stick their head in this cage, uh, in the hole right here so they crawl on in. If she wants to, if she didn't want to. But, you know, you usually grab them when they're... Uh, drinking <laughs> you know when they're, they're sucking up nectar so 
So once you get about five in there is what I do to, um, if I'm shipping them or bringing them to Hudson Valley Bee or something, or someone's coming to pick them up, I give them a smear of their own nectar. Uh, and she's good to go. And she can last probably a week in here or more. I ship them USPS overnight and they're generally there the next day. The, the sooner that she's used up, the better. She's pretty plump and long right now, but overnight she will actually shrink down. As she stops laying eggs, they stop feeding her so quickly and she'll be small by tomorrow morning like that. But I'm gonna let her back out of here and put her on back in. So. And while she is running out, make sure she goes on the right side there. But uh, I know I put a, a some extra brood in here so we can actually see what her nuke looks like. That's a nice looking brood, huh? Do y'all have to have to be scraping the box with your, this setup? Like with the foundation list, they're not sticking? Even to the sides, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, this is my hive tool right here, <laughs> you, you know? You know, every year I get the bee supply catalogs. I look through every page. I don't need that. I don't need that. Uh, I do. Get, you get a little side attachments here and there, but it's pretty minimal. And pretty much you can just like wiggle the combs out of here. And even popping the lid off, I just peel it back. It's not popping the lid where like every bee's looking at you once and hey, what do you think you're doing here? Big stacks. The big stacks I got to slice apart with a long knife, so they get really tall and they connect these combs around the next layer of skewers like that. So I slice through with a knife. And um, yeah, the, to, just to loosen it, and then there are some side attachments in the t oh, just in the top boxes though. So this is looking pretty good. And there's no like self-spacing frames in here. You pretty much just have to wing it organically. And I just pretty much take a mental picture of what the the nuke looks like before I open it. Did you come back yeah. out? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Mm -hmm. So you just get a feel. You try to avoid. Yeah, I know, right? Just like a real smoker. Yeah, these are just like real bees. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got in this one. So there we got we got a start. And let's see, do I have a marker? I do. So I'll write QC. I, I, I'll actually write. That's how you know what's here. This is how I make my notes. Yeah. And this one, I will write QR. QR, what do you think, Devin? What's that mean? Queen right. Queen right! <laughs> I got it right! Yeah. <laughs> Good job! <laughs> you get a B. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got in these like the now. So that's one of three mated queens that are in here somewhere. Yeah. I can tell you this one is probably yeah. raising one just by the the way I set it up. And in these divided boxes, I'm putting the larva right next to the divider. That's where they're sharing heat through that wall. And then the nectar goes right outside of that. So it has a little bit of insulation like that. So to see what's going on in here, I'll probably just move that one aside. I'll go right to this middle one and we'll see if we got some queen cells started. How are we doing? Got any? Mm -hmm. I got a couple on this side. So there's one. I don't know if there's a two, three, four. And there's one that even looks like capped already. So that's five, six. Maybe that's one, seven. And eight. So eight so far on this one. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. They have little tiny bees. They still got eggs that could possibly make a couple more. But I think eight is plenty when they only need actually one. <laughs> All right. So I know the other queen right box has the queens on both sides. So this one is probably at the same stage right here. Let's see if they're making any. But you see, it's just like a couple scoops of bees. You don't need a lot of bees to make a queen. It's just more about density and timing, right? The, the idea is that make these splits so easy and simple to make that you can do them all before solstice during their swarm season when times are really good. Any on that side? Dev, you want to take it? Sure. There you are, man. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I got a nice fat one hanging at the bottom. I got and one on, on this side, side too. Four, four frames. Yep. Four frames. And two of them go in are, are empty. Mm -hmm. Um, just 
Yeah, yeah the generally, the, when I'm doing this recipe, this this method, you know, it, it, this is a, an 11 by 11 inch <laughs> box, you know, and so four combs and four combs, and I can pull out that divider if I want to make it into a single toddler size. But for doing this, when I want those larvae to be warm, uh, mostly with a small population of bees, I'm mostly like putting them in the middle where the, the most heat will be, and the nectar, like this comb right here, comb and nectar, goes on the outside, and then on the outside of that, I'm just putting like an empty comb that I just get like from from anywhere <laughs> like so has drawn out so yeah that was from some somewhere or something some dead hive or something like that that they're starting yeah <laughs> who knows <laughs> what this was yeah yep yeah totally give it another couple weeks and you won't ever be able to tell they'll fix this right on up and then this outside skewer is just like a, a buffer if they run out of room I'm not gonna look at these things for another month and by then they ought to have not only Lane Queen, hopefully she'll be just, uh, they'll just be starting to cap her first brood, so I know that she mates well. What do you think? How many did we get on there? A bunch? It looks like, yeah. I'm Good. Mm -hmm. said that size, you don't have to worry about feeding them? Not this here. time of year. Nah. And I do give them food. I, I, I comb a nectar and I comb a larva. The ones I made the first week in May, when it suddenly rained for six days straight, they didn't fare so well. Um, they would have benefited from some food, I but I didn't do that. Well, yeah, well, would mm -hmm. you, how would you feed? I've done it all different kinds of ways and stuff like that, but you see this shiny bubble wrap? See these holes in here? Yeah. I take a, a, a quart, plastic quart deli container, punch about six holes in, in, the, in the top of that, and generally I only feed in the fall. I don't do any stimulative feeding in the spring, uh, and I can feed four quarts at once, and I'll feed a two to one in the fall when I've got these bigger hives that I'm really trying to put weight on quickly. And often I don't feed every hive. I don't harvest from every hive every year. That's that's for sure. And it's um so if I make the split a little too late, if I combine them too late, if it rains all of September or something like that, I I'll I'll feed and usually like maybe two rounds of that of that two to a gallon four quarts here of two to one doing that twice maybe three times is enough to get them up to winter weight they need less food in these boxes yeah. so that's for sure I've, I've overwintered single ones like these not the baby four combs that's an experiment I haven't done yet but eight combers yeah I have um, I've put them on top of bigger hives okay. so the heat rises and stuff but most of the hives I'm wintering are three of these boxes tall with one queen in a big full-size cluster like like that like like a tree cavity just three of those boxes uh -huh. three or four or, or something like that i've done all kinds of experiments with these things i have um six frame lang supers i have a bunch of lang equipment and i've been chopping it up into six framers and that six framer fits perfectly on top of here and i've been using that as a super it makes a t-shaped hybrid hive <laughs> yeah i put some shiny bubble wrap underneath the undersides that overhang and i do use them as honey supers all my lang combs are really old i don't like working them anymore and stuff but i have a lot of them so i use those and i do extract the honey from them it's like a hybrid hive and and it's therapeutic for me to cut up langstroth equipment <laughs> anyway i don't know why How about winter <laughs> condensation in these like with the you know, way you have your lid and since, ventilation since i've been using the shiny bubble wrap like a lot of langstroth beekeepers have been using this as an inner cover and that's really good and i've checked them out like in the winter peel them back and it's wet in there but it's something that that, that Seely says is that he doesn't like top entrances um uh, tom Seely because like he's studied the wild hives and they mostly have all bottom entrances yeah. whereas um what i'll do is like as, as i combine these things is um I'll, I'll leave one of their at least one of their top entrances open like like so but it's about six inches down or so like that and i'll put probably three or four of these la uh, layers of this shiny bubble wrap but that's it on the top yeah. You're saying? Yeah, right on the top. And then the tile, my, my, my favorite part. That's just tile. You know? Yeah. Tile. Yeah. And I have, I have kids. I didn't bring any um, designed ones like, like here, but I have kids paint different designs. I do like, like tic-tac-toe boards or things like that. It helps the queens orient when they see a different design on top of the tile. So, and they don't, don't really blow away. So. I'm saying wind tells Did I look at the thing. other side there? Does anyone remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, they, they, yeah. They, they both have QCs? Yes. Yep. All right. And that's a bottom board then? The standard the bottom Milk board. Great. Um, uh, it is a screen bottom just so I can plug them. And I grabbed these early this morning, but it was at six, it was already light out. It was still cold enough that they weren't flying, but it would have been warm enough by the time I got here. So I can just plug this with like a wine cork. That's how my mother supports the beekeeping operation. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can just plug these and go. You know, and I got this little bit of a, a rim here, so I, you can just... That's just a shim? Yeah, you, you, you can plug them and, and turn it like that. And so that, that way the air gets underneath and they can breathe while you're in transit.
uh, just like so. And I keep the combs going with traffic like that. If you're going like this, you hit the brakes, all the combs will like that. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just about. I, I, I basically um, got it to the point where I put about 500 bigger of these hives. And I got some Wangs, I got some Kenyan top bars and stuff, but mostly these. And I've got it to the point where every box has two holes and a groove in that bar rest. So every box could potentially be cut off, put on a bottom board with a divider slid in and be made into a mating nook. So if, like you have, sorry, so much, if you have no three problem. of these, right? Mm -hmm. Do you plug those with corks, or do you have one entrance on the bottom, or do you just leave all the holes open? Summertime, I'll, I'll pretty much leave most of them open because these things will beard out. And yeah, you know. go, that's what it's saying. Okay. Yeah, they'll beard out. They'll be bearding out tomorrow. It's going to be hot and, and stuff like that. So I'll leave most of them open. I leave most of them open all year round. It's it's a very small entrance. It's easy for them to d defend. I don't really have any problems with robbing or things like that because it's such a small entrance. It's not like that big Langstroth entrance. I think those are way too big. Those should be reduced by half or two-thirds all the time. Yeah. I, I think on a Lang. But I, I give the Langs a top entrance. I think a top entrance is good. It keeps them from, you know, suffocating in the snow and, and things. Is but, the screen built into the box right now? Uh, no, yeah. I, I can pop it off. Okay. It's, it's glued on there with propolis. So when I, when I move them, I do pick them up from the bottom. Gotcha. But like that. But I mean, I've got some... Uh, I think, yeah, this one had a, a masonite divider in there so that's pretty permanent that's like an old style but uh, most of them i've got like just a piece of sheet metal that i can slide in slide out so and i do put on mouse screens here's a mouse screen like like right here half inch that has to go over every entrance like that so that's a time. that's a real pain no just in october i don't want more and more i'm starting to leave them on all year because uh, you're going around november and stapling on the hive and they're cranky and bubbling out i don't like disturbing them at, at that time you know but it's got to be done. Mouse screen or die, pretty much. <laughs> Anything that's bigger than a half inch. So, shall we look at some more? Yeah, yeah they're behaving. Come on, little one. Mm -hmm. It's a great time of year. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. That, that's okay. So these, these have some cap cells. I know, because I marked them because I want them to go back to a specific yard. Other hives, but this one's way simpler. Exactly. I think the Warrior Hive, as beautiful an approach as it is, I think it's over engineered. Well, I wasn't doing the, I was changing the roof. I was just doing the standard. I've never done boxes. a quilt box. I know people I who have done them and that. with great wintering yeah. and stuff. I just, I'm not going to be hauling trash bags of sawdust around. Yeah, I got too many of these things. No, yeah, that's yeah. a thing. Well, the radio flyers stand Good. <laughs> I, I leave them outside <laughs> all winter. I've got like six of them. So, so the last one, were those sticks holding the frames up? Other sticks you had? Because it wasn't ripped. Um, which one? Uh, uh, the, the, the bar rest? Open, yeah. yeah, so I had this like, this brilliant, brilliant idea <laughs> one year that rather than doing uh, the bar rest on a table saw or finding some piece of scrap wood like that, I'll just use a skewer and staple a skewer on the side. It's a terrible idea because like if there's any bow in it, that there's just not enough oh, of, okay. a, uh, of an edge. On that, uh, on the skewer to really hold them. But the bar rest without ripping it, it's not like they build a cone under the bar rest and you can't slide it up. Um, you know, that's what I was wondering because if you have the bar well, rest versus a rip. What I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, is um, I'll, 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 I'll turn it slightly on a diagonal and then lift it. So that gives me a little bit more play on there. Especially like uh, I know that these have ripe queen cells. They're like 10 days old and stuff. I, and they're they like to draw them on the edges of these combs. So I got to be really careful. And I know that they're on this one because this would be nectar. Actually, I see one on, on that one too, so there's probably some brood on that one. So I'm not gonna pull either of those two. I'll, I'll start on the outside on this one, just for, for funsies, you see? Look, bees are being cute. Cuteness alert. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. No, that's okay. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. There's a lot of bees in there. Yeah, they're already capping some honey. On um, like pro probably honey, my honeysuckle's blooming, and the autumn olive, and stuff like that. So this was the nectar comb I gave. No, this was an empty comb because it's the third one out. So, and obviously on this nectar comb there was some brood. So again, since I know that there's um, queen cells on here, they could be on the edge, and I'm watching as I pull up, but I don't. I think we got through it without any casualties there. Any cells on that side? Nope, but there are on this side. So these are at day 10 or 11. I don't remember when I made this split. So that one and that one. 
Well, okay, okay. They're they're not like super huge. Those Ideally, are queen the queen cells. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, there's a virgin queen in there in mm -hmm. both of them. So, but only one is gonna get to be queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like Game of Thrones. Oh Game of Thrones. yeah. <laughs> Game of Thrones. You either win or you die. That's it. It's true. <laughs> So let's see what's on this one, see if we got anything decent. That's gonna be the next mama. Oh yeah, this one I saw the other day as I was putting it out. Look at that diagonal one. What do you think they were thinking there? <laughs> and I thought like, oh, maybe I had the hive on a diagonal, but yeah, they started, um, I saw the one on this side. Yeah, there's one on this one. That's a nice one. I hope that that one becomes the queen. Yeah, Yeah. That I'm rooting for her. <laughs> uh huh. So, but if they made this one straight at the same time that they made that one diagonal, the bees are doing weird things again. <laughs> it's like, you see, you see this diagonal cell? Like how bizarre that is? I, I don't know. I don't know if that's viable or not, but this one's pretty nice right here. That's, that's a good looking cell. That's about as good as anything that could be grafted. So I hope she wins, but who knows? I'm not gonna. On your choice. Choice. Bees choice. Queen, yeah. Do, like you got six of them, seven of them in there are gonna fight. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to get in fights and even when I won, I was in pretty bad shape. <laughs> <laughs> we did it at EAS, Eastern Apicultural Society. Uh, a bunch of us brought virgin queens one year. Yeah. That we had, I mean like a lot of commercial queen producers will, will pinch virgins when they find them and replace yeah. them with one of their cells. Often they may not be good quality or, or they want to control the genetics and often if I'm helping people I'll, I'll take a bunch home in my pockets or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But a bunch of us brought virgin queens that we had that were just extra. We had no room for them and stuff and so we had a virgin queen death match right in the middle of the conference. Yeah. <laughs> right there. We actually put them under a petri dish and people were throwing money down. It was it got, to, it got to be kind of a bad scene and they oh shut it down for next year but we gave all the money. People actually started bidding. We gave all the money to the EAS research fund and we felt good about that but it was really but, interesting but after all that ass whooping that even so that queen won well whatever queen won mm -hmm. doesn't she take a little beating winning all those fights you know I I don't think they do because it's not part of their it, 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 it's part of their life cycle you know yeah. like, like dogs and chickens probably not so much but I mean with Queens in the natural hive this is what they do yeah. if left to their own devices plus this the Queen stinger does not have a barb on it her stinger is designed to sting other queens. Yeah. It's also the, the, the same organ that's the ovipositor. It's where the eggs come out of. So it's like, it's, I think it's pretty stout, you know? <laughs> Most of the time they don't fight fair either. Yeah. The first one that hatches out will kill all so the other ones. By, by chewing a side yeah. of the, the cell out and uh, yeah, just stinging her in the side before the other ones emerge. That's usually what happens. No, it must work. This is, I was thinking, you know, maybe <clears throat> leave a couple so in there. That's so an okay one. So much damn violence. That's a nice one. Yeah. I'm rooting for her. <laughs> yeah. That slanted queen cell may come out to be an Asian <laughs> bait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That just happened. That's the kind of shit I would say, and my friends would say, that's racist. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't talk like that. Did I plan it? Or... That's a good one. I, I messed around. Like the first several I built were actual closer to true war I, I, I just got some rough cut 1x10s. You know, I'm doing everything super just, simply. Yeah, so I, I just made some 10 inch boxes. They wintered wonderfully. I didn't even put like bar rests or anything in them and I stacked them up three or four tall. They wintered beautifully and very little honey. I was really impressed with just the volume size and stuff like that and i i came the next spring and i would just like look at them from the bottom I'm like oh they're growing a little bit i come back in a couple weeks and look from the bottom again i was like oh they're growing a little bit more and then the third time i come lift it up and like a bunch of the combs had fallen down onto the ground some kind of support even just cross sticks or something if you're never gonna inspect them but like yeah just the weight of the combs like that they need some kind of support really once it gets hot oh, you know okay. but That's yeah what but i'm doing now and i was wondering I'm just making it. Uh, got a hollow tree, yeah. Once you're like like more than just a couple feet at, at a time, I mean, you could very likely uh, have them collapse. Worry, off the top bars were collapsing in New York the hot summers. Uh, not not standard worries. Worries had had bars in every box, every nine inches or something. I did bars on the top oh, and let them grow it. down like four feet, oh, like okay. beautiful long wild combs. Okay, gotcha. Very minimal. I was very lazy, yeah, you know. That's a nice one too. That's a really nice cell. Yeah. Solomon, you still got battery. It's still working for some reason. I'm rooting for her. Yeah. And look, this one has already been chewed down by the bees. Probably inferior weight or something wrong with her. This one, not as good. Who knows? 
we'll come back and look at these again tomorrow. Maybe they'll be starting to emerge. So check out check if out they that emerge, one. Do you think oh, that wow. they're gonna do anything with my boys over there? No. Do you know? Do your do your girls need help? <laughs> no, but don't you? find the congregation area to they're not gonna go mate for another week okay. or so after they're out so yeah i didn't bring any anyone who's like ready prime to mate mm -hmm. or but something they might be ready to emerge so are all your bees from those like 10 original hives oh no well like, you get yeah. I, always wonder when people I mean i, I catch breed. swarms and bait hives i've bought queens i've bought a lot of breeding stock from the russian bee breeders association i've bought Three hundred dollar breeder queens, VSH breeders, Russian breeders, mostly that. Any anybody who was like doing treatment free or survivor stock, I probably got a couple queens just to test them out and see how they do in this climate and things like that. But which no, is I, the I one that they chewed up? Um, it's right. It's right there. Oh yes, uh, I've known I've known Kirk a long time. I know Kirk like right when he was just going treatment free because he was my neighbor to the south where I started at Honey Gardens. And so when I moved back to New York, like, 11 years ago, I called up Kirk first. It's like, Kirk, hey, you're the best. <laughs> Can I come visit you and maybe get some breeders? And he let me handpick four queens from his isolated mating yard that he doesn't sell to the public. They were overwintered and clipped and, like, special, special, special queens. So I hope I've done them justice, but <laughs> I like that. But it's like, oh, but these days I'm, like, I'm more, I'm seeing, once I started tracking the VSH, I saw that that actually keeps its mite resistance generation after generation. Uh, whereas the Russian bees can go all over the place. You mess with Russian bees much? I never have, no. Mm -hmm. They're all, you raise a hundred daughters from a queen, they do a hundred different things. And I like the diversity. I like different cluster sizes. I don't mind different temperaments. I don't even mind swarminess <laughs> in my uh, But mite resistance kind of has to be consistent year to year. So the Russian bees don't all have it in, over the generations. I uh, guess it's mostly the grooming. It's the biting and grooming is what mostly Russians, and the swarming, <laughs> the Russians have to knock mites down. Uh, whereas the VSH is a very dominant trait that does pass uh, along over generations. Of course, we're breeding bees that cannibalize their own young. You'd think it'd be more controversial, but they sure don't have mites on them by the fall. And that's like a bee that um, you could really run uh, into a bigger hive and never do a brood break. And by the fall, they'll still be relatively clean or have very, very low mites because they're constantly chewing them down. And so but it's commercially viable. yeah yeah whereas I'm like yeah I understand that like being like like a commercial systems and stuff but I'm also like very like Darwinian you know I like the smaller cavities and having the bees that swarm and the the natural brood breaks I think you can take just about any genetics you let them swarm that natural brood break is enough to set the mites back for another year yeah. and that's what like Tom Seeley's telling us yeah. with his studies so I'm somewhere in between that bee sanctuary and the commercial bee aspect and yes. end of things but. Sure Robin's data, I think, is kind of showing that because mm -hmm. in the fall, the mite counts were, you know, where they were, mm -hmm. and now the ones we've just been doing in the spring, they're mm -hmm. like zeros, one, twos. They're all so back they, down. They've the dropped. Break, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, throughout all. Yeah, just winter is a very long the treatment break. system, not mm -hmm. just treatment free. Through mm -hmm. all three systems, mm -hmm. so the brood break is really important. I guess. Yeah, we get that winter long brood break, but going a whole brooding season where you're like reversing and maybe pulling a little brood out to keep them from swarming or if you're changing your queen with another quick mated queen right away if I something younger that won't swarm that swarm suppression growing a, a very large hive that makes a, a ton of honey that's what's going to grow like the most mites and really crash by fall unless it's a VSH I think VSH is like like one uh, like they've solved it the Baton Rouge lab I mean that's like like Bob Danka says we have solved the Varroa mite problem but the commercial <laughs> beekeepers won't use VSH queens for this, this, and this. They're, uh, they're a little bit OCD. They're really kind of chewing down a lot of their brood, even if a lot of brood that doesn't have mites, hmm. you know? And so they're not really up to cluster size for pollen, an almond pollination bee, which is like the driving force of the industry. But, you know, they tend to go into winter pretty clean and come out like surviving. So uh, they, they've cracked the code of like having a bee who you don't have to mechanically uh, like do a brood break or let them swarm or things like that but if you don't have vshbs or magic you know genetics i mean just letting them swarm is in most cases going to knock down the mites enough to uh to uh, keep them alive at least for another season you know yeah yeah seely gives it 80 percent you let your hive swarm you know you got an 80 percent chance of survival and that's no matter like really what they are that stuff you were talking earlier today about the mm -hmm. resting the bees' glands or whatever, all that. Hyperpharyngeal yeah, glands. Sounds, sounds yeah, it's like a period of fasting, you know. You, it's like, they want to take a break. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I'll just look at this one from the top. I don't need to pull anymore because these are in the, the same stage. I'll take the whole thing off so you can see what's going on. Center divider, once again, these, these are again at day 10. So they should have some capped cells on both sides here and how I started them. Larva here, a divider, larva there. Nectar on the outsides like that that works as insulations. Because I started these you know, 10 days ago, it was still very cold. And even you know now we're still getting cold nights, dipping down in the 40s and like a small hive like, needs to keep warm somehow, especially when they're queenless, the bees are drifting to queen right hives and, and things like that. Your little divider board, that's just wedged between your, your little uh, mm -hmm. frame holders. Uh, this is one of the ones that has, like, rather than cutting the the, the, the bar rest, I just stapled in a skewer yeah, exactly. <laughs> right here. That divider works. Terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> this one's actually tight, but if this wood starts to bow, like rough cut can, you yeah, gotta look yeah. at your heartwood, make sure that's facing out. So you, as you bow over time, it's gonna bow inward, not outward, yeah. and your bars drop. But if it bows outwards at all with the skewer bar rest, the combs will start to drop, but just like a little woodworking tip you know but other than that these things are super Scare easy to build pretty uh -huh. yeah so i got one little side attachment over here but i didn't even use need to use the knife what i'll notice as i'm working these things they tend not to attach the side at all that's close to the entrance there but they will sometimes attach the side that's away from the entrance that's where they're putting more of their honey down on the front like i said so let's see if i can get this out without m messing up any of the cells do i see one Da, 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 da. The cells there? No, I think we're good. Gentle. Uh -huh. So we got one right there. Got any on that side? Mm -hmm. The one that they're starting. Oh yeah, we got three right in the middle. One, two, three. One that's probably not going to come to completion, and one up there. So I think five, six. That's a pretty good one. Right there. I'm rooting for that one so far. <laughs> and then that amount of drones is kind of normal? Uh, I pulled these out of bigger hives that are raising tons of drones. About 10%. You pulled all these out of hives. Uh, like these boxes. I, 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 these were empty. I went to some of my survivors. So like one of the cool things about making splits like this is that I, every single survivor hive I have becomes a mother, becomes a breeder like that which uh, they are anyway if i'm letting them swarm and stuff like that but i can raise multiple queens from every single hive i don't have to say like this one is the one this is the breeder for this year but i mean i'll, I'll generally graph off a of five or six five or six breeders um and uh, often they're, they're multiple years years old but i have to like really make sure that they're they've got it because those are the queens i'm going to be selling stuff whereas in this case i'm i'm raising queens off of a hundred plus different survivor hives from right here in hudson valley and uh and you know uh, I, I'll use swarm cells if I'm going through the big hives and I find them and I put them in here or cups that are started. We'll just basically use whatever we find, you know? And by big hives, it's like four boxes you overwintered yep. or whatever. I'll slice them and often like slide in a queen excluder, maybe come back the next day and they can kind of like repair things, lick up the nectar that I cut and, and, and things. Okay. So that makes it a little easier uh, 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 to go through them. Because I mean, it's uh, they're very easy to work when they're like this. I don't think I've used the, used the knife once. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when they get really big and tall, then you get side attachments and they're just drawing, making their combs into one big long comb. So you got to go through with a long bread knife I How use. Often are you going through the hives though? One, pretty there. much once a year now. Oh, they so see really that they survive. Hard. I'm yeah. busting them into nukes. I'm putting them back together and uh, yeah. This is your typical mating nuke setup? Two, two mm -hmm. on top of each other to make four? Yep, generally. Milk crate. <laughs> I got about 80 cents invested in wood in each box. The screen is maybe 50 cents or so, and a piece of masonite or a piece of sheet tin in there is probably about 25 cents for the shiny bubble wrap. So you're looking at pennies. One screw on each side, you know? And that's not just to be frugal, it's actually because as you set them on top of each other, they will actually self-correct. Like that, they'll bow a little bit and actually seal themselves a little bit better to the box that's underneath them. So they got a little bit of give to them when you only use one screw. 